Shalom everyone, this is the complete concise guide for a joyous and easy Pesach uh, in the spirit of Torah Ve'ava, Torah with love, no guilt, no shame, no stress. <clears throat> As uh, we read in Mishlei, of life, its paths are paths of pleasantness. We should feel pleasant and joyous and happy on Pesach, and it is possible. We should not feel uh <clears throat> stressed or like slaves in Egypt. So uh, that would be very brief. Uh, let's talk about first preparing, cleaning, and construction of the house for uh, for Pesa. So some uh, important rules. One is polto. It releases the way it absorbs. That refers to flavor, meaning most of our concerns about kashut is the regard is around the kashut of the utensils or the kitchen or. Uh, uh, pots in which food was cooked is the, the fear that flavor was transferred from one dish, from one cooked food to another. For example, if you cooked in a pot dairy pasta and then uh, after washing it, you cooked meat in it, there's a there's the fear that the, the, the dairy flavor that was absorbed in the pot was released into the meat dish and now everything is tarif. Now, that was true 2,000 years ago when the Alakha was written in the time of Hachamim because the the quality of the metal or clay dishes that people use was very, very low. They were porous, and they would absorb flavor, and they actually would absorb a lot of liquids. The Talmud mentions that up to 25% of liquids would be absorbed in the dishes themselves. Nowadays, the uh, quality of metals and other utensils, the other materials that we use for our utensils and kitchenware has improved so drastically, even in the last 50 years, um, <clears throat> that in reality, no flavor is absorbed. This is also the opinion of Hacham Yaakov Peretz, my, uh, my teacher and master in uh, Yeshiva Midrash Faradi, and also the conclusion of Rabbi Dr. Jor Fixer, who was a chemist, who uh, examined the residue in pots after uh, cooking them several times. Uh, his conclusion is that the, the residue, definitely not flavorful, when it's infinitesimal, it's totally negligible, um, he is just concerned. He says, we don't know what is the flavor that the rabbi spoke about, but we know what is the flavor that the rabbi spoke about. It's flavor. It's what you could taste. So if you don't taste it, it's not there. It never happened to you. It never happened to me that you ate something and like on a plate and said, oh, yesterday they served, let's say, onions on that plate. We never do that. Um, the only utensils that do absorb flavor could be wooden utensils and iron casts that sometimes are deliberately left there to absorb flavor. If you want to make sure that, or you want to assert for yourselves uh, that certain uh, pots or dishes do not absorb flavor, you could conduct an experiment at home, or you could trust me, I did that experiment. What I did was I cooked very, very spicy food in a pot, habaneros, jalapenos, onion, garlic, many spices. The just smelling it was burning. Uh, I tasted a little bit, it was extremely spicy. Then I washed the pot, and while still hot, cooked in it bland rice with no uh, salt or or oil. And I asked my daughter to taste it, since my uh, taste buds were compromised. She confirmed that it had no taste whatsoever; it was completely bland. And uh, this is how it really works with all the uh, silverware, pots, kitchenware that you have, stovetop, uh, the fridge mixers, whatever you have. So it means that if you have your sets for pesa and you want to use them, go ahead, no problem. But if you want to use your uh, everyday year-round uh, utensils, all you have to do is put them in the dishwasher. That's just for the good feeling because just washing them, they're already kosher for pesa. But give them another round if you wish. All the other things in your kitchen, countertops, fridge, Kevin is just clean them regularly. No need for uh, any thorough cleaning or any burning of any surfaces. Uh, Stovetop and oven, just if you know, clean them regularly. But if you want for the good feeling, you could leave them on for about 20 minutes on high. Don't use the self-cleaning option for the oven because it usually fries the, <clears throat> the electric circuits there. If you have induction uh, uh, stovetop, no need to, to, there's no koshering for it. It never it doesn't absorb, it doesn't release anything. <clears throat> when in doubt, don't use the utensil, but you could really rely on that That scientifically proven all of our utensils, except for wooden and 
iron cast do not absorb uh, flavor. So that makes it easy to clean the kitchen. Just everything that is clean is clean. You could use it for pesa if necessary. Uh, and whatever has hametz ingredients, you just seal it, put it in the closet, and sell it with mechirat hametz, with the sale of hametz, which I'll speak about in a second. The second rule, that, which is important, is en hozeh meaning that if hametz was mixed into non hametz before pesa, it does not reawaken on pesa. I mean, it would not happen that on that dormant hametz that is in the mixture, uh, would wake up on Pesa and say, oh, well, Pesa is here, let me go and cause some damage. No. If there was a mixture before Pesa and there was a ratio of 1 to 60, which caused the Hametz to be annulled, that's it, it's gone. The whole mixture is not Hametz. Therefore, anything that was made and bought before Pesa, even if you have suspicions that it might, came, might have come in contact with Hametz <clears throat> in the factory, or maybe it has a trace ingredient of Hametz, Unless it has real hametz in it, uh, you could use on Pesach. So jams, jellies, pickles, frozen vegetables, uh, soft drinks, uh, dairy products, all these things could be used on Pesach. There's no problem. Uh, another rule, shinui aminak, change your custom. So generally, we try not to change the custom. This is how we've been trained. This is how we were taught. But the truth is that everybody changes the custom. Any division of minhagim that you see today stems from someone deciding not to follow the minhag of their previous generation. So why don't we do it? The, the main reason is that in the past, people lived in insular communities. So when traveling from place to place, if you would do something that people were not familiar with, it would look very strange. It would cause, cause strife and mahalokit. Today, we live in a global village. Everybody knows that we have Sfaradi, Ashkenazim, Temani, Maurem. People have different customs. If you want to adopt another custom, another custom, another minhag, you're free to do so, but be careful. Don't do it publicly so not to offend other people or at least get a consensus in the community of how you do it. For example, if you have a minhag of using electricity on Yom Tov, but your synagogue doesn't have that minhag, don't go and flip switches uh, in front of everyone, but you could do it at home. Uh, and that also refers to kitniot. If you have the minhag of not eating kitniot, you want to change it and eat at home kitniot, there's no problem. You could do it because you could decide that you are going to follow the Sephardic Minhag. Even if you want to be strict and follow the original Ashkenazi Minhag of not eating Kitniot, you could uh, narrow the observance of that Minhag to the original decree that was only regarding certain grains that you can ground and make into flour or make porridge from. But not it did not apply to peanuts, corn, soy, quinoa, or any other uh, things that people call today kitniot, and it did not apply to liquids uh, either. <clears throat> Another important rule is shema imtzagus kana'a, the fear of finding a nice cake. This is really why we clean the house and why we search for hametz. The rabbi said, we are afraid that on Pesach, you will forget that it is Pesach, and you will find at home a nice cake, a nice cookie, and you'll eat it. Now, have in mind that in the time of the Mishnah, people didn't care much about what their food touched. They actually used to save food in the wall, in a hole in the wall. That's where they save food for fear that it will be eaten by mice. And if a mouse did eat from your bread, the Talmud says, no problem, eat from the other side. We would never do that. So think about that. When you clean people, the most common example, cleaning the toys, God forbid you found a noodle or a, or, or a Cheerio stuck at the bottom of a Lego brick, right? So what? Are you going to eat it? If you would have found an opesa, you would eat it? Of course not. What you're searching for is a nicely wrapped cookie or cake or or uh, um, or chocolate bar. As long as you don't find it, there's nothing to worry. You clean the house, you know the thing like that did not go in. No worries about crumbs, about uh, flying Cheerios or, or, or crawling pretzels. This is, once you clean the room, you're good. Another important rule, uh, unfit for a dog. So especially if you have pets, you might have heard that you need kosher food for pets. Not true. Why am I saying not true? Because people don't look at the in context. When the halacha was written, when they spoke about unfit for a dog, people did not have pets. They had animals, but they had working animals. They had a dog that's supposed to uh, guard the house. So they lived with the animals. There were animals all around. 
Nobody had pets and nobody had special food for pets. What people did have, what people did give their animals, was leftovers. Whatever I eat, you eat. So they would throw it to the dogs. So anything that was fit for humans and then became unfit for humans, but still is fit for dogs, would still be considered hametz. But if it was never fit for humans, if it was made for dogs, Purina, whatever, all the all the brands, food for dogs, cats, other pets, does not need hersha. The only thing that I would tell you to avoid is uh, baked baked treats for dogs, just because they look like cookies. Uh, but you know very well that if you go to a Petco, uh, they will have by the counter a little uh, bowl with uh, dog doggy cookies, but they will tell you it's for dogs only. There's a sign, because some people by mistake took from it, but it's not edible for humans. And for that reason also, cosmetics, uh, antibiotics, medicine, vitamins, um, obviously detergents, all these things do not need extra because it's not fit for human consumption. Um, now, well, let's talk about the battle against Hametz. We have five stages. According to Hachamim, was only searching for Hametz and then nullifying it. But we do cleaning, searching, annulling Hametz, burning and selling, just to make sure we cover the whole angle. So if you did that, you have nothing to worry about. You clean the house, your house is clean, good. We searched for the Hametz. Today it became symbolic because there's nothing in the house. And that's why the rabbis a couple hundred years ago came with the idea of leaving crumbs around the house. Make sure that the crumbs are well wrapped so you don't lose one. Even if you lose it, it's not a problem because it's not edible. But make sure that they're well wrapped and maybe take a picture or make a list of where you hid all the crumbs. I know people who lost one crumb and got hysterical before Pesach. <clears throat> Annulling the Hametz, how does it work? The Nahmanidis comes up with an interesting uh, explanation. He says, <clears throat> sorry, Hametz is not really yours. But the Torah made it yours to make you punishable for it if you have it. So it's enough for you to say, I do not want to have that Hametz. So by stating that you have denounced the Hametz, it's not, uh, it's not yours. Uh, then you burn the hametz that you found and you sell all hametz, all other hametz that's in your house. And that that sale is also uh, greatly symbolic. It's denouncing the hametz that anyway doesn't belong to me. We sell it to a goy, we sell it to an anju. Uh, you could put anything in the in the cabinet, in the sealed cabinet. If you have extra stuff, you could put it in a, in a sealed separate uh, freezer and consume it after peso. Um, okay, now that we've spoken about more of the, most of the halachot, if you have any other questions, you could always email me at hovadia at gmail. Um, it's also, you know, you can find it in the uh, in the e-bulletin into of Torah uh, Let's talk a little bit about the symbolism of Hamed. So my theory is that Hamed equals paganism. Why am I saying that? Uh, in Exodus 12.3, the mitzvah is given to Bnei Israel to eat uh, to eat matzah. I have to change that once again. On uh, it's already given on the tenth of Nisan, right? So already on the tenth of Nisan, the Israelites are told that they uh, they are going to celebrate Pesach, Pesach and that they are going. Uh, to eat matzah. So it's a mitzvah, it's a commandment to eat matzah on the 10th of Nisan. Uh, and then it, they, Hashem also tells them, you have to eat the Pesach with matzah. And in verse 18, it says, you must observe the mitzvah to eat matzah, to commemorate the Exodus. So matzah is a mitzvah. But then in the same chapter, it says that they carried the unbaked dough. They took it uh, they took the the uh, the dough and without baking it. There were 600,000 men who traveled from Ramses to Sukkot and only there they baked the dough. So how is it possible they did not become Hametz? Just going from one side of the of the camp to the other would take you more than several, several hours. How is it possible? Uh, so the answer is that uh, even though people say that it's 18 minutes, it's not. It takes about 26 hours for the dough to rise without leavening agent or a starter dough. Try it at home if you want. Uh, my uh, my mentor and rabbi, uh, Professor uh, Simha, um, Mary Simha Feldblom in Barilan, actually 
did the experiment in the Department of Chemistry, came to the conclusion it takes about 26 hours. In room conditions, normal, they tried all combinations. Which means that in ancient times, people did not know how to make bread. You usually made matzah. That was it. You mix flour and water, you put it on the pan, you put it on the oven, you eat matzah. Uh, how do we, we know that? We see that when the uh, messengers came to Lot, right? What did Lot give them? He baked matzah for them. That's in Bereshit 19.3. Why would Lot bake matzah for them? It doesn't celebrate Pesach. Yes, right? This is what you make what you make when you have no time. So who knew the secret of making matzah? It was the priests of Egypt. So for Am Israel, when they once in a while would get remnants of matzah, leftovers, sorry, of hametz from the Kohanim of Egypt, they associate with Avodah Zarah. We also see that in Bereshit, Mem Gimel, Lamed Bet 43-32, when the brothers visit Yosef the second time around, they uh, they were served separately. Why? Because it says, Lo lechol et lechem, ki The Egyptians cannot eat bread with the Hebrews, for it is an abomination uh, to the Egyptians. Abomination means sacred. The Torah doesn't want to say sacred about Egyptian paganism. <clears throat> and we also see that Hametz is not offered on the Mizbeah. So, the secret of bread was in the hand of the Egyptian clergy. It was associated with paganism, and that's why Bnei Israel were told not to eat matzah on pe- not to eat hametz on Pesach. That's why they didn't pre- prepare provisions because they don't have a bread on their own. They have to ask the Egyptians to give it to them, and that's why the dough did not rise until they got to Sukkot because it takes very long time to rise. Technically, the Torah could have told us to never eat hametz because it is associated with paganism. But Hashem had mercy on us. So during the year you can eat hametz, but on Pesach only matzah. But in Bet Hamikdash, which is the sec- center of the sanctity, you eat, you only serve matzah and never hametz. Now, let's talk a bit about Pesach. The uh, the sacrifice of Pesach, the lamb, is actually a vote of confidence. Why? The uh, just before crossing the Red Sea, we see the Bnei Israel tell Moshe, "Are there no graves in Egypt? We'd rather serve Egypt than die in the desert." Meaning that they were very deeply uh, immersed in slave mentality. They're afraid of the Egyptians. Uh, when so, keep that in mind. When Pharaoh tells Moshe to worship God in Egypt, Moshe refuses. Why? He says uh, the Egyptians would stone us to death. Because we're going to slaughter their idol, the lamb. So now Hashem comes to Bnei Israel just before Pesach. And we see that in uh, in chapter 12, verse 8, 9, and tells them you have to eat the, you have to take a lamb and slaughter it. The Egyptians are going to be extremely offended. You are provoking the Egyptians to attack you. And he tells Bnei Israel the meat should be roasted. You cannot eat it raw or boiled. Maybe they wanted to eat it. So you know what? We'll eat the lamb, but we'll eat it raw or boil so the Egyptians wouldn't smell it. He says, no, you're going to roast it so the aroma will waft throughout the neighborhood. Everybody will know that here lives a Jew, a Hebrew, an Israelite, who slaughtered a lamb and ate it. Not only that, we are told in verse 46, you cannot break the bones. Because the Israelite said, you know what? We'll eat the lamb, but we'll break the bones. So if the Egyptians come, we'll say, hey, we just ate chicken. No way. It has to be a lamb. Also, if that was not enough, it says, mark the doorposts with blood. It's as if you put a neon sign telling the Egyptians, I live here, come get me. Now the Torah says, the Torah says, God will see the blood and it will be poser over your houses. We usually say, we try to skip to pass over and he will not let the destroyer come into your houses. Meaning, Hashem needs a sign. He needs to know where does an Israelite live so the uh, the plague of the firstborn will not hit you. But that's very strange because previously we read regarding the pestilence in chapter 9, verse 6, that only animals owned by Egyptians died in the plague. And the hail did not fall over Israelite areas. And the darkness only affected the Egyptians. 
So if God knows exactly where to bring darkness, plague, the pestilence, and hail, why does he need to mark the houses of the Israelites? doesn't make sense. The answer is found in Yeshayahu 32.5. Actually, this pasuk is quoted by Rashi, but he gives it a different explanation. In Yeshayahu, we read, like birds who fly, Hashem will protect Yerushalayim. Protect and protect, Pasoah and protect. So we have four synonyms. One of them is Pasoah. So obviously Pasoah is to protect. That's the other significance or the main significance of Pesach. In Hebrew, it means to protect. So what does God say? He says, the blood will be assigned for the houses where you live. When I see that you are brave enough to slaughter the Pesach, roast it, and mark your doorposts, I will protect you and make sure that the Egyptians, the mob, will not come and blame you for the plagues, but rather they will go to Pao and blame him and will make you leave Mitzrayim as eventually happened. So Pesach is a vote of confidence. Matzah is disassociating ourselves from uh, idolatry. Pesach, Matzah, and Ma'ol together are the historical memory. That's the importance of Lela Seder, which is also a reenactment of the covenant. We could sum it in this phrase, Know where you come from and where you're going to, which is said about the individual, but also about us as a nation. We have a historical trajectory, as Ami said. We know where we came from, we know where we're going to. The Mishnah in Pesachim says, you start with the negative and conclude with the positive. We say we were slaves. And nowadays, when we look back, we could say we lost the first temple, we lost the second temple, we were slaves, we suffered under the Inquisition, the Crusades, the Holocaust, the pogroms, whatnot, terrorism now, terrible situation in Israel. But we know that we're always able to get over it with the help of Hashem, with the unity of our nation. So this gives us hope. Uh, the Seder is a message of hope to all of us. That's why when we eat the Matzah, we call the matzah lechem oni. Hazal said lechem oni. We think that oni comes from the word respond or affliction. But Hazal said lechem oni, lechem she onim al devarim arbe. Bread upon which people are onim many things. So is onim respond? No. The anot in the Torah means to testify. As in the Ten Commandments, lo ta'ane be'ra'achai do not bear false testimony. So we have several instances in the Tanakh where people testify in connection to the Exodus into the covenant. One of them, on a personal level, is the Bikurim confession. Hachamim call it confession. The Torah says, Ve'anita ve'amarta. When you bring your first fruit, you should be one. Respond, say no. You should testify. When you bring the Bikurim, you testify that Hashem fulfilled its, his part of the covenant. Hashem said, I will deliver you out of Egypt. You will become a nation and I will be your God. God delivered. We have to be God's nation. We have to follow in his pathways. When Moshe speaks to Bnei Israel before his death, he does the same thing. He tells the story of the Exodus, and he summons the heavens and the earth, to be his witnesses. When Yoshua speaks to the Israelites before his death, he does the same thing. He tells the story of the Exodus, Exodus, he confirms the covenant with the people, and he tells them, you be witnesses. Look it up in Yoshua, it's an interesting uh, chapter. Also in the Hemya, speak to the people, he makes a pact with them. He says, he tells the story of the Exodus again. In his case, there's an addendum, there's an additional chapter that of being subjugated to the Persians, but still he says, we know that Hashem is with us, Hashem delivered us, and we commit to the covenant, and they actually make an amana, a covenant, and they sign it. So we could say that in every major turning point in the life of the nation or the individual, when we bring Korban Bikurim, it's a major turning point. I'm, I've harvested the field. I have my crops. When we do the seder, it's a, sh it's a, it's another turning point. We've completed another year. We start a new year with the seder memory that is passed from generation to generation. Moshe, Yoshua, and Hemia, It's all a transition of leadership. So whenever I have this transition of leadership or a major turning point in our life, we say the story of the Exodus, and we have witnesses. In our case, the matzah is the witness. And that's why I call it lechem oni, the bread of testimony. Lastly, I want to speak about the seder as a response to destruction and from there to segue to the custom of the seder. So the rabbis established the seder after the destruction to fill in the void that was created by the loss of the temple. 
and to lift up people's spirit. Uh, it gives us hope, as I said before. We know our past with it, our ups and downs, and we understand that we can come out of the, the most uh, dangerous and the lowest situation, just like if we saw we still are struggling after October 7th, but our enemies thought that they had us completely nailed down and that, that we'd never be able to rise again. And we prove them wrong, and we will prove them even more wrong than that when uh, we defeat them completely and we unite with one another and Be'ezot Hashem will have Geula Shalema. I think that's also the message of Ben Zuma when he says, you say it's Yad Mitzrayim Balilot. He's not talking about reciting the story of the Exodus. He was talking to people at the time of the Roman oppression. People thought that all is lost. Ben Zuma says, listen, don't talk about the Exodus. Don't mention the Geula only when you're when you're good, only when everything is nice and dandy, only when you can go to Israel, stay in a hotel, enjoy on the beach, everything is beautiful, missiles are not falling. No, even when it's dark, even when you think there's no way out, talk about the Exodus because this is Vesham, that this is the promise that suits for us and will take us out of uh, Galut, out of the darkness. So in that, with that in mind, we have to remember that all the Minagim of the Seder are the customs of Greek and Roman aristocracy at the time of Hachamim. What did Hachavim do? They said, you know what? On Pesach, we want you to feel like a king. You're oppressed. You're downtrodden. You lost the temple, but don't give up. Once a year, for one night, you're going to be king. So at a grand feast, people used to recline on couches, drink at least three glasses of wine, appetizer, main course, and dessert. Hachavim threw in another cup. For Birkat Amazon, we have four cups. Because it was a fancy meal, like in a fancy restaurant, you make it on the spot. You don't make dishes and leave them on, on the fire, on the on the stove all day. So when people would gather, they would close the doors and say, okay, we have 20 guests, for example. Cooks make food for 20 guests. But meanwhile, while the cooks are making that, people would dip vegetables with salt or uh, vinegar. And that said that, that Hachamim established is amazing because it's a multi-sensorial uh, experience. You eat, you drink, you smell, you hear. The memories remain embedded in your mind. Uh, and one more thing, just uh, a curiosity. If you look carefully at the Mishnah Masechat Psahim, chapter 10, you realize the first, originally you first ate the meal, and then you asked the question. And that makes sense because, like, for example, one of the questions that we ask is, all other nights we eat hamet and matzah, but tonight is all matzah. But if you didn't eat, how do you know that? You can tell the, the child, hey kid, wait, we didn't have dessert yet. The cake will come later. How do you know we're not going to eat hametz? Right? The answer is, you finish the meal, and then you ask the questions. And then you could ask, why maro? Why hamet? Why matzah? Why only roast meat? Why did they change it? Very practical. It's very probable that after a couple of years or maybe decades or hundreds of years that they ran it in that way, they realized people fall asleep after the meal. No one is alert enough to say the Agadah, so they switched it over. So now, we'll, I'll conclude with some uh, quick laws of the, of the Seder. According to the tour, also written in Shohan Aruch, you could start the Seder early as long as you get to Amotzi after sunset, meaning if sunset is at 7 and it takes you about an hour to say the Agadah, you could uh, start the Seder at 6 p.m. Wine. Drinking wine is symbolic. Originally, only the leader of the Seder would drink, so you don't have to force yourself to drink large quantities of wine. Everybody else, other than the Seder leader, could drink just a little bit wine or grape juice just to taste it. And even the, the leader of the Seder doesn't need to drink more than three and a half ounces, which is over if you eat. If none of the people there can drink wine or grape juice, um, I had this question referred to me by Recovering alcoholic, believe it or not, they did a set up together. So what do they drink? Whatever you consider a special and unique drink, this is your wine for the setup. Celery, you can eat as much as you want. Don't worry about Bachahona or the last blessing. It will be covered in Birkat Amazon. Uh, the Babylonian Minhag, which I wholeheartedly recommend you to adopt, is to eat the hard-boiled egg immediately after the karpas to quiet down people's uh, hunger. And then also fresh vegetables are served to the diners and some cooked food to the children. And this way you could sail through the Haggadah uh, with a calmness and, and tranquility. Matzah, how much should you eat? 
So the answer is why you, you should eat one kazait. And I'll explain what a kazait is. The obligation is one kazait for hamotzi and one kazait for korech. That's really what is obligatory. Uh, but if that is if, even that is too difficult for you, only the kazait of hamotzi is the real obligation. What is kazait? Literally, like an olive. It's a little less than the volume of a the thumb of an average person. Uh, reclining, symbolic. Uh, today it's not comfortable uh, to recline with our clothes, with our tables, so you don't need to lie down on chairs or tables or couches. You could just lean a little bit to the left and you're good. Uh, matzah shuya, I mentioned that because some people have this stringency of not eating wet matzah or gebracht. This stringency does not apply to today's matzah. You could put today's matzah in water for years, nothing will happen. Where does this stringency come from? There was a time in Europe when they, because they didn't keep the yacht and they had no substitute, they used to bake thick matzah, four inches thick. And when they would slice it, they would add strings of dough and pockets of flour there. And that's why they wouldn't eat gebracht. Today, no worries about that. Lastly, let's talk about the afikoman. Some people think that you cannot eat anything after the afikoman. So you eat the meal, you eat the afikoman, you say, like at Amazon, you want a cup of water or a dessert? No, you can't. Not true. Afikoman is a custom that existed in the time of the Mishnah. The people used to invite each other for dessert. When you had festive meals, you can't always invite people for the festive meal because everybody's eating at home. So you do dessert, dessert hop. You just go from house to house to have desserts. desserts. The rabbi said, this you don't do on Pesach. Why? You don't do the Afikoman of every year of going from house to house to have dessert. Why? Because it's important that you stay with the family or with the group with which you celebrate Pesach. Today, you're allowed to eat after the Afikoman, after Berkat Amazon, you could have desserts, you could drink coffee, whatever you want. You just don't eat bread again, no matzah again. This was the custom of my grandfather. Uh, I hope that you enjoy this. If you would like to support Torah Ava, you're greatly appreciated. If not, no worries, just listen. Celebrate the Pesach, enjoy, have fun, and may we uh, Mary to see the Gula Shlema Bimera Amen.